Today we've got a very special guest, Vince Cellini. Uh, he's been a, a broadcaster, uh, a golf host for over 40 years now. Um, he's done Super Bowls, NBA Finals, uh, World Series. Uh, you could go on and on. Uh, we're so excited to have him on today. Um, enjoy. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another edition of the Travel Royally podcast. We're very excited today to have a friend of ours, Vince Cellini, a um, world-renowned, uh, um, I was going to say podcaster. That's not true. A broadcaster, not a podcaster. So when you hear his a resume, yeah, a step up. When you hear his resume, you'll understand why we're thrilled to have him. So Vince started his career as a local broadcaster in Cleveland, and he left to join CNN. He worked on CNN Sports Tonight with Earl Van Wright where he won a Cable Ace Award that I know he's very proud of. He joined TNT, and he was a broadcaster on Sunday night NFL. He hosted Game Time as part of the NBA schedule with some very famous folks. He's covered, you're not going to believe this, 10 Super Bowls, nine NBA Finals, and four World Series. Um, he worked at the Golf Channel, still works at the Golf Channel, and he's hosted multiple shows there that we'll get into later. And he's covered all of golf's majors. Vince, did I miss anything? No, I think that's uh, that's you know that's that's fine. That's sure. enough. That's enough. Yes, I also did. Uh, yes, I also was the uh, field announcer at Trinity Prep uh, for baseball and football for my children. So <laughs> now batting for the Saints. Uh, <laughs> but no, I, and I, when I I've been to Super Bowls, I, I field anchored those those events that you talked about, where you're kind of the lead. Uh, anchor for panels or just the the uh the actual presentation and uh you know when i hear that now jeff it's interesting because i'm you know i I'm, as i get older and i have a birthday coming up in a few days it's uh i'm pretty amazed that some kid from the east side of cleveland got to do all this stuff really some kid from nowhere so it's, right. i'm pretty i'm pretty very very grateful that all those things happened and i'm talking to you today so thank you and hey well, you and I grew up in the same era. We grew up in the same state. We probably yeah. grew up as Buckeye fans, right? Yeah, sure. Of course. Um, Not Cincinnati fans? Up. Come on. <laughs> yeah, he's the Cincinnati Bearcat quarterback. So, yeah, we got some connection here. <laughs> but you and I grew up, I would say, poor. Rich, rich from a family perspective, but our families didn't have a lot of money. Um, and you've lived an extraordinary life. Tell us, what, what was it like growing up in Cleveland? Um, my dad was, uh, like many of the dads there, he just scraped out a living at a local factory, um, as his father did, but we had a home and we had, uh, you know, four kids, one bathroom, um, <laughs> and, uh, two, two resident, uh, home, you know, we had the one on top and a family and then uh, two resident dwelling, I guess. Um, I grew up on 152nd street and St. Clair Avenue on the east side of Cleveland. It was a very gray Brown existence. Not a lot of grass. You found a little patch of grass to play on. Uh, you were lucky. Um, but I had an amazing neighborhood and friends and I had the church and I had, uh, you know, people who loved me and I felt safe and secure. And I always felt like we had, um, we always had something to eat and a place to go home to. And then just a lot of love in the family. So I was, I'm glad I grew up that way. And I'm yeah. glad that it, I, I learned from an early age that if you want something, you have to work for it, you know, and you have to, uh, you have to have a little drive. And, and I think growing up that way, you learn on the streets pretty quickly. Um, you, you're sort of wise to the way of the world. You know, you're not, you're certainly not in a right. bubble. So right. it was a, it was a wonderful place to grow up now. And I look back on it. Uh, we didn't have anything, but nobody had anything, but we had each other and we had places to play and we had things to do. And, you know, some kids went to the wrong side of the tracks and some kids, you know, kind of found their way. But um, it was a I wouldn't trade it for anything. It was it was it was really a cool upbringing. Now, you were a pretty good I mean, you were good at several sports, but you're particularly good at football from what we hear. Well, and you were, were you a tight end at the College of Woo? Yes. Um, I, I was a, uh, I was actually playing, that's kind of a long story, and that's, it's a long, boring story. Baseball was my first love. I love baseball. 
because I felt like I was a better baseball player. And uh, even through high school, um, I thought I had a, a really good career when I finished high school baseball. Um, I played out center field and first base. Um, and I played football and I enjoyed football because that's kind of, my older brother was a football star. He played all sports actually, but you know, my older brother was a football star, but in high school, I was playing kind of an outside linebacker backup, uh, two tight end set guy, but I, I, I didn't like, I was out of position playing linebacker in high school. So I moved to tight end in college. I made the commitment to move there because I thought I could catch pretty well. And that turned out to, that worked for me. They, they love me so much, Jeff. And this is a small, I know Hayden, you're a big school guy, but I'm a small school guy. So I didn't know how, I didn't think I was that good anyway. And I come to find that when you play in the crown conference at that point, that point in Cleveland for the Catholic league with St. Edward, St. Ignatius, Benedictine, Padua, uh, it's every, every week is a grind against really St. Joseph, really really good players I mean yeah. guys who become pros so by the time I got to college I thought you know the, the good part about going to college was new position I didn't know anybody in college new coach and and I thought I everyone had a clean slate so I, I got a chance yeah. to play yeah yeah it happens that way I, I actually have a similar story I, I think baseball was my um my number one love as well uh it's just that when you're playing baseball and football the the path to get uh, to college, I think is better through football with um, scholarship money and and that sort of thing. I actually had to go to Cincinnati early as well, so I didn't even play my senior year of baseball, which mm. broke my heart because that was my love. Oh. Imagine leaving to play football and not being able to play your senior year no. of baseball when you love baseball so much. So, no similar story. Hey, I, I, Hayden, I think the question is, if you guys were the same age, and played on the same team, how often would you have thrown to Vince or would you just use him as a blocker? Or his hand, do you think his hands are as good as he says they are? He's a tall guy, so that's a big frame. I, I love throwing to tight ends. It's just uh, in, in college we had a joke that you have to throw to tight ends as if they were a statue because they can't reach far. <laughs> I will tell you the catch right here. No, no, no. I, will tell you, I, I, didn't, I didn't catch in a box. And that would have made you look good. If you get it near me, and I'll, I'll tell you why, because we did not throw much in college. So I thought anything my way, you have to. I, am, I am catching, man. That's your chance. You only got a couple chances. Now, I'll tell you, I just said this to a teammate of mine, college teammate, whose son is getting married this weekend. I'm heading to Cleveland for a wedding. Uh, and we talked about it. And I said, can you imagine if we threw the way they throw today? I mean, literally, my, my junior year, you're not even going to believe this. We threw 100 times in the season. The whole year. The whole year. That's incredible. Yeah, you know, it's funny. He hundred times set the school scoring record or uh receiving record, right? That was my best year. I, I had 18 catches. I and I averaged almost 20 yards a catch. I had six touchdowns that year. And wow. So that's like 10, a, 10 throws a game. That, that's Jerry like Rice is eight Jerry Rice is uh caught 18 in a game. <laughs> I, that's what I'm saying. These if I played today and I saw the Worcester coach a few years ago, he said, I'd have made you an all-America today if we if, we, if I had you back here today. All they do is throw. They throw all the time. I threw 50 yeah. in one game. Oh and my god. I threw 100 in a season. Unbelievable. I mean, hey, by the way, you guys, you guys both have college records. You your record still stands, doesn't it, Vince? No, no, not anymore. Wow. I, I had uh, the touchdown one uh, career and season was broken when they started throwing. And then I had one for uh, yards per catch was 19.8 for a long time. And then that that was broken, too, by a couple of wide receivers. So, so. I got something over Vince. Yep. It's all in the dust a, now. A, Hayden's got a record that still stands at Cincinnati. 557 yards. 557 yards in a game. You ran for 157. I threw. I threw 557 yards. Oh, 557. Oh my gosh, that's unbelievable. So that hopefully exactly. that was a, a 50 year uh, deal before me. So hopefully it can it can last. Desmond almost got close. He I think he got up close to 500. He scared me, but uh, he decided and you to hold off for three me. quarters, right? Yeah, I came in early second quarter. Well, you know, the I'm going to kill. And, and that, that's so impressive. The interesting part about this is the evolution of sports in general, including golf. You know, we see now where these guys hit the ball as a, and, and 
the, no. the self-correcting ball and how the game is just bomb and gouge. Whereas, you know, the, the older guys will tell you, well, we had to shape it. We had to learn how to hit shots and we had to learn how to do all this. So the evolution of sports in general has, has definitely come to golf. And in terms of athleticism, Jeff, as we talked about, these guys are athletes playing on PGA tour. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you technology. what technology. I'll tell you what I think the difference. Go ahead. I, I'll tell you what I think it is. Here's what I think part of it is. Um, you know, I, I played sports in high school and I was a decent athlete. I thought I was good. Um, when you meet someone and Vince, you may be among the people I'm going to reference, but when you, when you see Hayden, um, he's an athlete. I mean, he's good at whatever he picks up. I mean, he's got, there's something about being about, about being an athlete where you're, you're that good. I, I mean, I wasn't that good. I mean, no. I played baseball um, against Andy Vance. Like I say, against, he was on our team and um, he was, I, I didn't, I, it was a summer league in upstate New York where I went to work with a friend and he was really good at everything. He could dunk a basketball. He wasn't that tall. He wasn't even the best guy on our team. And he had a long career in the majors and still a coach. His son plays in the major leagues. Um, there's something about the, about these athletes that are, you know, those of us that think we're good, when you when you meet a real athlete, it's it's something no. entirely different. And I realized that right away, too, as I got to cover professional sports. And you realize how good these guys really are at the next level. And But we've all had people we played uh, with and against. And a good friend of mine, Andy Canavino, who became the Michigan defensive captain of their 1980 team, Bo's greatest team. He was a guy I grew up with. He was good at everything. I mean, he was like the best eighth grade basketball player, baseball player, football and when you see guys at the professional level playing other sports and doing other things, activities, you realize just these how, you know, I'm going to tell you, my middle son has that a little bit. He's not at the professional. Level. He's one of those guys that does everything well. Like yeah. he he's one of those guys, maybe Hayden's like that, too, where he can just pick something up right away and be be good at it. But he's good at, you know fishing and throwing axes and, you know, baseball and golf and, you know, random he, he, stuff just random stuff he picked he could ride a horse he never rode a, he rode a, a two-wheel bike i think he was three and he's speeding around he just got on a bike and rode he's one of those guys and i was always go yeah. i hate those guys they're always good at everything darts that's a funny story that you pulled up the bike story because um i threw my training wheels off at like two years old <laughs> <laughs> my parents were like that's in, that's dumb but well vince we're here to talk to you about golf you mentioned yeah. golf how and when did you develop an interest in golf? Um, I always, I always appreciated golf very much. Unfortunately, uh, unfortunately, where I grew up, we didn't have access to golf that much. And and you have to remember, Jeff, we're kind of, I'm a little, maybe a little older than you. I can't remember. We're, we're about the same age. Yeah. My dad played golf in a kind of a golf work league, but it wasn't as popular and cool as, as it is today. I mean, golf was kind of a thing you messed around with and we'd go to the one patch of grass we had, which was a hundred by 80 yards and just, you know, hit wedges and try to play games. But I always appreciated golf. And then I appreciated even more when I started playing with my father-in-law in a league and he really worked with me. I, you know, I had never really had a lot of uh, golf lessons or training and he taught me so much about the game. That's that, that really, I still hear today from top yeah. instructors, well, um, including pause at the to top, like uh, Hideki. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I no, no, I'm saying it. like including he would always say pause at the top, you know, and, and do this and do. And, and he was right about a lot of things. And you talk about the training. I mean, I was playing with persimmon woods back then, Yeah. you know, which we all were, which is a little different. Um, so but I, I always uh, I always enjoyed the game and I realized the the skill level that it takes to uh, to play it, to play it well and how much you have to actually work at it to play it well. Well, I'll tell you what, Vince, I, that Hayden may not realize this, but those persimmon drivers that you and I used to hit in the 70s and 80s, they were smaller than five woods are today. And they, they were woods, so they had a very small sweet spot. And what this reminds me of, Vince, you may recall, I forget what, what year it was. It, 
Jack Nicholas was playing in the Open Championship at St. Andrews, and he drove the ball through the green with a persimmon wood and a balada golf ball. I mean, that is – I don't care if it was downwind. That is a – there are guys that can't do that today. No, but, you see – and sometimes they'll have those guys hit uh, persimmon. They'll hit some old clubs, and they'll feel, they'll feel the difference in it. And yeah. just how, how less – not forgiving at all. So that is impressive. I, I remember seeing uh, Hogan's clubs at the World Golf Hall of Fame, a set of his clubs, and he, to, to see I – I don't know how he played – how he did it. I really don't yeah. when you yeah. see what, what he's playing with. It's, it's incredible. Now, how often do you get to play now? Do you play often? You know, I – through situations, some injuries, I haven't been able to play as much. Um, I played a lot when my son Adam was here and he would say, come on, dad, we're going to go play. Come on, let's go play. Let's go play. And he would drag me out to play. And I have to watch him blast the ball, you know, 50 yards past me, which is, we all love that. Right, Jeff? When he, those younger guys hit it by us. Like they, yeah, <laughs> Playing from the, the back tees too. And he's like, oh, that's pretty good. Yeah. I'll, I'll get your club. I'll see you. <laughs> so I played a lot with him. I played a lot when I moved uh, to Florida to, um, go to golf channel when I had some time alone, I lived for six months alone and I really actually practiced. I, I practiced putting and I would chip and putt and I would, I played a, a lot and I got, I got pretty decent, but not that much anymore to be really, very honest with you between work and projects. I just have not had, uh, had time to play. Last time we spoke um, when, when you did the uh, speaking engagement with us, uh -huh. you talked about when you move into a new role, uh, how much, um, you have to learn about that new role when, when you did, I think it was uh, hockey that you had to learn. Um, is it the same with golf? Did you, when you started with the golf channel, uh, did you get a different perspective after like starting to learn golf, how difficult it is? Um, and did you want to play more just so that you could understand more? Um, I did. And you're absolutely right. It's uh, it's very hard. It's it's very hard to go into the realm of a of a hockey or a NASCAR or golf. It was NASCAR. <laughs> yeah. And if you don't if you don't know that, then you you are you will be exposed very quickly. And so yeah. I I really made it a point to immerse myself in all of all things golf and understand what the process was for all of these these players and what it meant to win here and understanding money lists and, and promotions and different levels of the game. So I had to really work at that and understand um, their strategies so that you could speak with them uh, following rounds and, and speak and in in sure. uh, connect with them uh, in that way. So um, yeah, I had, I really had to learn a lot about the game. And, it, and I, I think I said at the speech, it took about a full season of covering the PGA tour to, to really feel comfortable and understand what, uh, what all those levels meant and being able to kind of gain the trust of players and converse with players in a three or four question interview segment where you feel like you're really going to be on it, you know, and, and be able to get your arms around the, the, the subject matter. It's, yeah. it's, it's very difficult. Not only that, because I think, I also think the golf audience, the viewing audience is probably the most critical audience of any sport, in my opinion. They're ultra, ultra critical because everyone at home would hit the shot differently. Everyone at home sees it a different way. Well, why didn't you ask this? You should have gone this way, you know? And so I, I think that's also uh, a part of it. Very critical. The, the fans, yeah. I want to go back to your golf game. <laughs> sure you do. Sure <laughs> as, I'm, as I'm trying to steer away. <laughs> right. <laughs> so I know you, you recently went on a golf trip with a buddy of yours that I think many of our listeners will, will know, uh, Craig Can, who you worked with at the Golf Channel. Yes. So I want an honest assessment. How would he describe your golf game? Um, uh, let me think. How would he describe my golf game? Um, Disturbing. <laughs> I should have called him in advance. Uh, yeah, to, no, we actually we, we were we were planning to play golf. We never really got to go out and play golf. We got kind of preoccupied with some other activities, but uh, I would probably call it disturbing at this point. It's just I think it's like anything else. I think golf is about practice and consistency. And if you if you don't practice, you're not going to be consistent. So that's you know you you have to go into it if you're a 
a part-time player with the attitude of, look, I'm going to enjoy myself. This is really difficult. Um, if I want to drop a couple of balls and hit, then, then do that. But if you can take away a, a, some moments, you know, from that particular round and really the enjoyment of playing with someone else. But I, I just don't take it that seriously anymore, you know. And I will say that if I have to pick, if I have to choose between, you know, four or five hours on the golf course or maybe some other things that I need to get done, including my workouts, which are important to me, then I may go in that direction. I think I, I, I go back to what Kevin Costner said, and I feel the same way. I'm not sure that I have the patience for the game sometimes. I don't know that I have the, the right demeanor. Costner said he thinks golf should be 12 holes. He said, after 12 holes, I'm pretty much good. Yeah. And for some people, it, it is that way. Some people can play 30. They can't stop. They love it. But I start to sort of, I sort of drift a little bit, I think. And that's just, there's a course, there's a course in Scotland called Shishkine. Uh -huh. It's 12 holes. That's awesome. Yeah. They love it. Yeah. Now you played golf with one of your buddies, Charles Barkley. Now I know lately his swing looks a lot better. Did you play yeah. with him during the swing transformation? Yeah. And I, th I think, I think for Charles, you know, it's, it is funny and we all had a good time with that. The, the sad part is he really did want to be better. He really did enjoy the game. And because of the hitch or whatever that was, the, that <laughs> demonic, uh, whatever possession he was possessed. I think disturbing. He couldn't enjoy the game the way he wanted to, and I think you know it, it was a cause for embarrassment. But he's come a long way. Um, oh, he, he looks good bad. now. He looks yeah. great. I mean, you probably see me post his swing, right? Yeah. It looks it looks good. Yeah, and, you posted where he was with Darren Clark and Darren yeah. Clark, and he hit a beautiful tight draw down the middle. It was unbelievable. And there's no hesitation in there. You know, he gets himself set, lines up, and he pulls the trigger. And that's the way I think you have to play golf. Um, I think that you see amateurs stand over the ball and waggle and waggle and restart and think, and then you're dead. Um, but he's found a way to now process all of this and just get the club back, get his chest through, and just and just go. And then, then you know, see what happens. Going back quickly to golf expectations, um, yes, might put it really well one time. If you're not practicing three or four hours a day, you shouldn't expect to make every shot. I mean, the pros practice four hours a day and they still don't make some shots. Uh, so I, I really like what you said when you, you can't get mad. You can't expect to be the best out there. You're supposed to go out there and have fun and don't expect to, to be good because you're not going to enjoy golf. No, if you expect and, to be good. <laughs> and, and you want really serious. And Jeff, you, you guys have seen pros. They you walk the range, be on the range with these guys. They're they're artists. You know, you're you're looking at someone who's at the, the you know, these are the best players in the world. So don't even try to judge yourself. And, and it's funny, I go to I'll be out at you know at a restaurant or something. Some guy will say, Yeah, you know, I'm my club champ. You know, I thought about playing on the champions tour. You know, I thought about it. <laughs> I said, Did you did you really think about that? <laughs> You should go give that a try. You have no <laughs> idea See how that works. Yeah. You know, I talked yeah, to, I, I talked to Rocco Mediate about that. I said, I said, you know, I see guys all, he goes, yeah, I know. I see those guys all the time too. I said, well, come on, come on out. Let's, come on, let's go. Let's go. Let's see how that works. I'll for tell you what, I, I met a guy who was really good. He was scratch. He said, yeah, I'm, he was in his late forties. He goes, I am going to, I am going to try out for the senior tour. And I'm like, I'm like, this is like 20 years ago. I go, okay. You think you can beat Tom Watson? Are you insane? I mean, I mean, think about that. I'll you tell you what. Well, you, you never three putt. Okay, they lag to two feet every time. Every they're, they're yeah. up and down out of bunkers. You have to understand that that these guys who play at their clubs are picking up five and six footers, and then they come in and say, "Yeah, I shot seventy five today." Did you, yeah. or would you have <laughs> missed those putts? So. You know, it's really different when you're playing and you have to play and putt all the way through and you're in a tournament and you're playing against other guys and there's pressure. So you also have to play the tips. <laughs> yes, it's completely different. OK, yeah. it's not the same game that you're playing. Yeah. And that's what I try to convey to people. I said, you don't understand. It's like people who think they can hit a major league pitching or they can. You know, I had I'll tell you, OK, I'm a I'm a ham and egger tight end guy. So years ago, I'm working at TNT and Randall Cunningham, we go to a football field for a, a segment. He's throwing to me and he's he's throwing freaking rockets that I've never seen before from from someone. OK, it's yeah. like I went, what the hell? 
this is not even like anything ever that I've seen. Yeah. So imagine, yeah. you know, when you're, again, the level of play and the artistry and the athleticism, all of those things combined. Uh, so I, I had a similar experience, Vince. I, one of the first time I threw a football with Hayden, I mean, he throws it like that, right? And you're like, like, <laughs> you're like lighten up. I mean, we're just, and he, it, to him, he's just, you know, he's not trying to impress me until he threw one 50 yards in the air to my daughter. That was, I knew he was trying to impress me then. Yes. But, but you know, trying to sweep um, my father in law. I got another question for you, and then we're going to move off your celebrity friends. Shaq, <laughs> does he play? I know he, you guys hosted shows together. Does he play yeah. golf? I don't think so. I think he's gone out there and messed around, but um, no, I, I, I don't think so. And I think a lot of this has to do with I pin, it, just his body type alone. It's going to be difficult for him to to do something like that. You know, I mean, Shaq is is enormous. He's the biggest person I've ever met in my whole life. He is. He's literally. I, the, did. I saw I used to have season tickets for the Hawks and I had seats uh, in the lower level down near the floor. And um, I went down, I took my kids down to the floor and he was he, it was during warm ups. The first thing you see is not how tall he is, how big his feet are. Correct. Because they're like, you could put both our feet in his shoe. But then <laughs> when you look at him, you go, he's over seven feet tall and weighs 340 pounds. And he's must, it's not fat. He's just like the hugest human being you've ever seen. Yeah. Okay. Two things about Shaq and his size. Okay. One, one day we, we do a lot of court segments at NBA TV and we were on the court and we did a segment where Shaq would get the ball in the low post. And th then I'm supposed to come down like a, a guard and double. So when you do that in the pros, what, what they're taught to do is, is throw, do this and throw their elbows to, so that you just eat an elbow and you know, you break your jaw. Well, Shaq gets it like this and he starts. And I said, big man, no, wait a minute. I stopped. I said, <laughs> no flashbacks. I said, I am not going to do this. I'm not running down there to, to take that. And he just, he started laughing. But another time he came in maybe 15 minutes before the show, which was a lot of time for him uh, at night. And <laughs> he was getting dressed and he, uh, I'm in makeup or getting ready. He goes, hey, Vince, tie my tie. Tie my tie for me like yours. So he gives me his tie and I, I don't know how to do that. I have to stand a little. So I'm trying to like, the tie is seven feet long. Okay. So I'm trying to tie a tie and loop it. And I'm feeding all the material down through this tie. And I'm like, when do I stop? How, where would it be on him as opposed to me? So I'm tying it to my knees basically wow. so that it would fit him. But it was like, it was like a, a rope from a boat. Like that you would like, you know, anchor a boat with and, and in, in the dock. And that's what it, it was that long. And I finally got to go, I don't know, Shaq, is this going to work? He goes, yeah, that'll, be, that'll work. But he, uh, he's such a, he's really a good dude. Really, really good. But I don't think, no, not built for golf. Yeah, I get it. You do a great impression. That actually sounds like him a little bit. Yeah, that'll work. Yeah. Vince, what happened with that? Vince? Uh, well, I'll tell you what, he's uh He's everywhere from an endorsement standpoint. And oh my God, he's America's pitch man. I mean, he's an amazing guy. I, I he uh, and he and he cares about people. And, you know, and the other thing is, Kareem. Not to interrupt you, Kareem. I always felt was uh, did not embrace his height. That he was almost uh, insecure about. Like if you watch Kareem, he kind of walks hunched over and all. Shaq loves yeah. being Shaq. He loves being Shaq. You know. He, he, have you and, have and, you seen the outtake from that pizza commercial? I know the Papa Johnson. No. He goes to someone's house and they think that he's Michael Jordan. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you know, a lot of people like as famous as him would say, "What are you talking about, Michael Jordan? I'm Shaq." He just he was just very low key, just went along with it, like you know, wasn't offended that they thought he was. Uh... But you know, I I I think of athlete. The thing about golf is that being athletic doesn't necessarily translate to being successful in golf. I, I don't think. I think golf is, is is a skill, and it's it's a skill. But like I, Bo Jack, I just saw Bo Jackson at the Regions in Birmingham. He was playing in the pro am. There's not a better athlete that ever lived, maybe than than Bo Jackson, who who just gets up and you know he sees it and hits it. He has no, you know, he hasn't been doesn't have an instructor. 
yeah. uh, hits it a ton, but he may not know where it's going to go. So, uh, you, you know that, Jeff. I mean, it's and and Hayden, you it's a it's a game. It's, it's such a skill game, and uh, it's well. So I, I think for the children listening at home that don't recognize Bo Jackson, he was. I mean, the most amazing football player I've ever seen. I had season tickets when I lived in L.A. when he Did got you? drafted, right? I was there when he stepped on the boss's chest, <laughs> you know, when he ran him over. I mean, that, that was the signal of the end of Boz's career. But I was also <laughs> there when he jammed his hip against the Bengals, right, that, that ruined his career. Oh, yeah, but the you thing were there, that's huh? amazing, he was the MVP of the – of Major League Baseball's All-Star game with a replaced hip, mm. right? I mean, I know he was a designated hitter, but – Well, he's the only guy to ever played. play in a Pro Bowl in the NFL and in a Major League Baseball All-Star game, the only person. And he uh, – Bo Jackson was a Heisman Trophy winner from Auburn, running back, uh, played two sports, played for the Royals and the White Sox, and he played for uh, the Raiders. And, uh, I mean, I thought – First of all, I'd never seen anybody look like that in a baseball uniform. I thought, my God, <laughs> this guy is. Yeah. So well, amazing. I was living in L.A. at the time, Vince, and they had a uh, – it was the first time I'd ever seen one of those where they literally, like, somehow paint the side of a building or, or apply some kind of applique, and it was him on the side of a building, like a 20-story building. And you'll remember this. Um, they used to do those Bono's commercials. Bono's baseball, Bono soccer. And they had him um, in his football pants, no shirt. They had his shoulder pads on. He was holding a baseball bat. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah. And hey, this guy was like ripped like no one you've ever seen. I mean, it was like, I mean, home in a baseball it, it uniform. before Jordan, really, and his big, I mean, Bo was the face of Nike in the early 80s. Right. And yeah, that whole campaign uh, started the whole. They designed the shoe uh, for him. The, yeah. The, the cross training shoe. I think that's the advent of the cross trainer. Right. Uh, went with right. with Bo, and uh, but just yeah, remarkable. But you know, it's funny. Golf is so humbling for for guys like that. I remember talking to Jerry Rice at the uh, American Century. Here's a guy that's the greatest, maybe the greatest player ever but talked about the intimidation of hitting a ball off a tee in, in front of people. And, yeah. the, you know, sports, Hayden, Jeff, you know this. We're sort of like in football and baseball, you bear down, you know, but golf is at your, at your most, your heightened yeah. awareness. You, you back off and try to find the relaxation, which is the yeah. exact opposite of everything we're trained mostly as athletes to do. It's, right. it's really incredible in that way. Well, Vince, I, one of the things I find really fascinating about your career, and I, I, I'm, I'm being completely honest, right? I love your work, right? I mean, I, I remember when I first met you, and um, I, so Hayden, I had met him, and I, I turn on the TV, and there's Vince talking to, to, I don't remember who it was, but it was the PGA Champions uh, Learning Center, and uh, I, I love the interviews that you do with these guys. I, I find them fascinating. Um, but I want to go back to your first day at the Golf Channel, at least your first on-air opportunity in 2003. You were the host of Golf Talk, and the first person you get to talk to is Arnold Palmer. <laughs> I mean, what the heck was that like? Well, he's Arnold's the co-founder, and of course he's Arnold Palmer. So anyone who ever is a sports fan – knows who Arnold Palmer is probably at least in our era I mean I know Jack was maybe the the better player but Arnold was the king I mean he was yeah. it so it's a big deal I, and I hadn't been on TV in about 13 months I took I took severance from CNN sports and CNN so I was returning actually to live TV for the first time at Golf Channel with a live audience and Arnold Palmer <laughs> I said well, I said I wonder what else we can do to to just raise the, uh, the, the, the right. level of difficulty here. Is it, do you want me to juggle also? Should I? <laughs> so uh, I'm kind of nervous, actually. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm excited, but I'm nervous. And Arnold, meet him. Uh, I've probably met him years ago, but I met him again backst backstage. He's getting ready to go on. And 
Peter Kessler had had that show for many years. And before I got there, the Kessler had left the golf channel and whatever their dispute was. But part of that was his questioning with Arnold Palmer about the use of certain equipment that I think Kessler may have uh, may have said it directly or indirectly it was not legal, as I recall. And I yeah. could be wrong. But anyway, they had a dispute over the equipment. So Palmer looks at me and he goes, just remember what happened to the last guy who uh, who got out of line or whatever he said to me, you know, but he was kidding. He said it kiddingly. Uh, and he's a Steeler fan. I'm a Browns fan. So we kind of got into that. But <laughs> what a what a wonderful, gracious, uh, nice man. Everything that you ever heard about him made made everyone around him always feel like they were important. They were his friend that he relaxed the room. He just had a, a charisma about him, really, not only on the course, but in real life, too. Just be a co-founder of the Golf Channel. Just uh, He's just a beloved, a beloved figure, I think, in all of, all of sports. So that was, that was really exciting. So that's how I hit the ground running there. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, Vince, I, the, my first experience with him, my only experience with him, I was at the Masters in a practice round on a Tuesday. It's probably 2004, 2005. Uh, David Duvall was at the height of his golf career at the, at the time. And they were playing a practice round together. And, you know, as you might recall, uh, David Duvall was a long hitter. He rips one down the middle. And this was on 14, the uphill par four. Mm -hmm. I'm over on the right side of the fairway. And Barney or Arnie comes up, his ball comes up, hits in the trees, drops near our feet. He comes up. And at this point, he's probably 64, 65. I mean, he's, you know, he's not going to make the cut, but he was still playing in the event. And uh, so he walks up to us and he's very friendly. And he's like, hey, everybody, good to see you. Thanks for coming. How's everybody doing today? Glad you're in the shade. And the whole time he's doing it, he's nudging his ball with his foot. <laughs> do a better lie, right? Like out of the rough. And then he and then he kicks it real hard to the middle of the fairway. Pro goes, tip. There you go. Yeah, exactly. Pro tip. He's like, hey, have a great day, everybody. The nicest guy. And I saw him go up to um, the people that were the volunteers that worked there. The You know, they got hard hats on. I would see him go up to people. I know he hasn't seen in a year with the hard hats on, give him a hug. Good to see you again. You know, just like you said, he, he made people feel like um, he was as interest, more interested in them than he was, than we were in him. You know, that's the, the point of that. I'm listening to you tell that story in my travels and in my work with athletes and really with people to me in a much, much smaller way. You have to remember that when you meet someone, and someone knows who you are as an athlete or a broadcaster or an actor, that really, that 20 seconds is, is their, that's their view of you, you know, that right. 20, 30 seconds. And that's what they take with them forever to retell. And so when you, you, you it doesn't take that much. And, and, and the guys and women who do it very well are always remembered very fondly. And it just doesn't take that much to be kind to people and someone who it, that's their only chance they'll ever be near you, you know, yeah. for some of these guys. Yeah. That's a great point. Now, not only did you host golf talk, you hosted golf central top shelf Wednesday, big break, great news, 19th hole. And yeah, several seasons of big break. Did you, you have a favorite that you hosted or. Um, I, I really enjoyed the live froms because I thought there was a vibe to majors live from the majors when I got to do um, either early or late coverage that, that, you know, anytime television live is meaningful, I really enjoy that. I think it's impactful and meaningful and you're conveying information and you're on the fly, all those things that really television should be that I, I enjoyed that. Um, but I also enjoy big break because big break while it was a grind, you have to remember, we, you know, we take 10 big break shows and it was a show a day from five in the morning till seven thirty, eight o'clock at night every day yeah. and it's a grind and you have to try to make it but you have to bring that energy the next day but i love the fact that we have people who are trying to change their lives we have personalities 
And I think it's still a show that draws drew the most interest and draws the most interest. In fact, I think it might be coming back. Somebody I heard that it yeah. might be doing it. On Golf Now, they're hosting it. Yeah. So, um, you know, I it's uh, I enjoyed that. I enjoyed it because it, it puts people in as close a competition tournament that you could probably be with golf where you have to make a shot. Yeah. My and dad and I so. absolutely loved Big Break. We actually, we have a golf saying that has lasted to this day, specifically from one of the players, um, this really cocky player, everybody hated him. Um, oh, I know who you're talking about, Ron. I'm not sure who it was, um, but we always, he, he hit a shot over the green uh, and he says, man, I, I hit it too pure. <laughs> and we always say that. So like when we hit a bad shot, it's a little bit over, hit it too pure. <laughs> <laughs> so That's we so love funny. it and we, we love it. but that. you know that guys guys have to uh you can't go bad in your own mind you can't turn on yourself you know it's got to be you know i'll just see i hit a right spot just didn't react like i thought or you know just yeah. see that take off or you'll see guys miss putts and they're always like oh. you know it, it didn't do what i it was supposed to do right i hit it perfect i would hit it right it just broke I, it's just I, green hey, <laughs> i was playing in scotland at Presswick with uh, a buddy of mine that, that Hayden knows named Dale. And um, we're about 130 yards out into a little bit of a wind. And, and uh, I've got my nine iron and uh, I hit it on the green, you know, decent shot. I look over and my buddy Dale is about the same distance and he's got a, a, a fairway wood in his hands, right? And I look over at him like, what in the world is he doing? And he hit a perfect shot with this thing. And it sailed right over the pin, past the green, into grass, this side. They never found the ball. <laughs> and um, so later in that round, uh, and, and his caddy is, is beside himself for giving him the wrong club. He misread the distance. So later in the round, Dale hits a perfect shot and Dale goes high five. And the guy, the guy has, he's only got four fingers on his hand. And the guy goes high four. <laughs> um, anyway. Oh man. Uh, now you've covered all of the majors. Do you have a favorite to host? Um, all, of golf, all of golf's majors? Well, I think, I, I think PGA championship from a standpoint of, um, sort of the, what's the word I'm looking for? Sort of the egalitarian com composition of the tournament itself, or the, just the, the fact that it seems like, even though it's the most, probably the, it, when it was in its old position on the, on the schedule, it had the, the, the best field. It just seemed more of a, a relaxed atmosphere than some of the other majors. Um, I like the fact that it, I, I like the vibe of the PGA championship. But I love the grind of the U.S. Open, and I love when players would would. I don't like to see them struggle, but I, when they're beside themselves about things and set up, and you know, I it, it's supposed to be really hard. You know, it's supposed to be really hard. So maybe you just try to hit the middle of the green and you two putt. You know, maybe you don't try to do something spectacular where par is your friend. But I love the grind of that. But then again, I love the tradition of the Masters as well because. Yeah. The Masters does everything like it's in a time warp, in a beautiful time warp, where the game is is respected, it's covered, it's talked about. Um, you conduct yourself in a certain way, and it's presented in a certain way that's timeless to me. And so I, I do love that. So I kind of I'm all over the place, but those are the things that I like about the man. And then of course the Open, just the history of the Open and being going to St Andrews for the first time was like going to uh, its hallowed ground. It's it's there. There are places where it literally got chills. Old Yankee Stadium, first time in the dugout there. Yankee dugout. Uh, St. Andrews, uh, Lambeau Field, um, and probably the Rose Bowl to a certain extent. To, for me, what the Rose Bowl meant as a kid, you know, Big Ten kid growing up. But um, it, it's it just to go there, see the city, the down, see how close that street really is to 18 when you don't see yeah. that on television with the, when the stands are up. Yeah. And we shot a big break there. We shot segments there. Uh, it, it was it was an amazing day. It really Did was. you ever get to play there? 
No, I didn't get to play. I, we shot a, uh, we shot learning centers there and we shot big break there, but I didn't get to play there. There were like practice rounds going on with players uh, both times. So, but it's what a, what a, what an incredible place. I mean, what a, it just magic. It's magical. What a, can you imagine playing with your sons there? Oh my I wonder gosh. if you know anyone that could set that up for you. Well, maybe I know a guy, but, uh, <laughs> You know, just Lynx Golf, I got I got to shoot a big break at Carnoustie. We did the U.S. versus Europe. And Lynx Golf, Jeff, you remember the first time you probably you probably remember it, right? Playing Lynx Golf for the first time. They, and they're like, oh, there's no trees. This is awesome. This is great. <laughs> and, then, and then when you do miss hit, you're like, well, you talked about the Heather and all that stuff. That you get. You're like, this is, oh, my gosh, this is impossible. <laughs> this is impossible. Well, Actually, Vince, I put this up in your honor. This is Carnoustie behind me. Yes. So, so are we looking yeah, back from the right. are we looking back from the hotel there? Is that where we're, we're um I'm not what sure is, what hole that is. Um, but I know it's Carnoustie. Very few uh, you see trees off in the distance. They're not on the course, they're beside the course. Right. But um Carnoustie is a brute. We've got I've got we've got a some clients that are going there next year in may and it's a couple's trip um four couples yeah four couples four guys four women and um they said hey the women we're going to play nine rounds uh, but the women only want to play seven which one would you which two courses would you recommend they not play and without hesitation i said well carnoustie would be one and they're like why that's an open championship and they go it's a brute. I mean, it is the, the hardest test in golf. If it's windy, they're going to spend half their day looking for golf balls. You, you all might be, right? If it rains, it's a miserable slog on Kernisky. There are other courses that are really great, that if it is windy, the course is wider, the grass isn't as high. Right. You know, it, it's going to make for a much more pleasant day than looking for like an Easter egg hunt. Looking but for I, I, I also enjoy the fact that when you you head to places like St. Andrews or Carnoustie, that it's it's people are walking their dogs through the through the course and you know yeah. taking walks and it's pu it's public, I guess, right? I mean, it's like a park. So yeah, the, St. Andrews is is not a private club. It's owned by uh, the St. Andrews Lynx Trust, and you can buy a uh, what they would call a ticket as a resident. For I think it's 250 pounds or in that neighborhood, and huh. you can play unlimited golf <laughs> for 250 pounds. And they, we pay, I think we pay 295 pounds uh, to oh, play man. once. Well, um, we we had one day off in our shoot at, at Carnoustie, and uh, one day, and so we got to go into town. And I remember walking through town, and a woman was on a bicycle next to me and, and as I'm walking she's slowly biking next to me and and I said hi good morning and then she stayed there and I said hi may I, may I help you and she said are you the presenter on golf channel are you the presenter and I said yes I am the <laughs> presenter but that night we we somehow found our way to a local pub you may find that hard to believe really yes Vince Cellini in a local and we're breaking the story here <laughs> and uh I will tell you, the Scots are wonderful people. They are just the, the most welcoming, nicest, warmest people, probably to a fault. They, they did not want us to leave. And, and, you know, they were trying to shame us into sort of staying. Where are you going? Stay here. We're having a good time. And I said, listen, I got to shoot in the morning. I can't, you know, <laughs> they're throwing them back, man. And I said, look, I, I can't stay. I will, yeah. or else I, you know, they'll leave me behind. But uh, they're... They, they were wonderful. That's my introduction to uh, Scotland or was my introduction to Scotland. And uh, it's uh, just really, no. it, it was a wonderful experience. And just, I don't know, there's something, you know, this Jeff, you're there. I mean, it's, there's something about being transported back. I think when you, when you go to those places, there's, yeah. it's really incredible. You know, you feel some sort of connection to, to pe the past. Yeah, I agree. Don't, don't you love the town of St. Andrew? I do. It's I mean, beautiful. I mean, yeah, it's beautiful. Beautiful. And Tommy Ganey, you know, Tommy Ganey was on the tour now. 
I, I was going to bring him up because he was on the big break with you. I remember right. that. So on 18, they're doing, uh, I think they had to play 18 as one of the challenges. So Tommy is, you know, he hits up there and he hits to the left um, of the green. And he, at that time, now there's, you know, this isn't set up for the, the open. There's nothing on the streets at all, but maybe some parked cars. There were parked cars and a van was parked there next to 18 on the street. Well, Tommy hits it and he, he comes out super hot. I mean, he miss hits it. And this thing goes shooting over the green right toward that, you know, the shop with the glass windows that, that's yeah. right across the street. Yeah. But fortunately it went bang and hit that van. But if that van had not been parked there, I don't know what we would have been responsible with in terms of damage to what took place there, because that thing was headed to the shops. It would have shattered windows and they would have, we would have been banned. We would have been walked off that place or worse. Um, uh, did it bounce back onto the green? Yes. Yes. But he, I, had a I mean, yeah, that's, but you know, you stand there. I stood there with, uh, uh, with Roca, Constantina Roca. We did a, seg a segment about oh you know, God. the Valley of Sin. We, we, we talked to him about, you know, his shot there. And, you know, we went down in the, that swale and we stood there and he, he went and did the whole story. I go, fall on the ground again, do it again. He goes, no, I won't do that. But he was so nice in talking, you know, the duel with, uh, with yeah. Daly. John Daly. Yeah. At, the, at the open. And he was fantastic. So it, this is the thing about those guys that are champions tour age. You know, they have the, the history, they're living history. And to be able to stand there with him and he recalls it all was, was just fantastic. That was, that yeah. was a great experience. Well, Vince, I was playing at the old course once with some buddies, guys that I grew up with from my neighborhood in Cincinnati, right? Kind of like your buddies, right? The guys that you've known since you were a kid. Yeah. And my friend Brian, he's got a nine iron into 18 and he skulls it, right? So Hayden, behind the 18th green, there's a rise up a hill and there's a green fence with crossed, <laughs> crossed uh, slats on it. It hits that, I mean hard, and bounce back to about six feet. Right? And his caddy goes, I've never seen backspin like that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Well, I mean, but had that it. bench not been there, if someone was standing there, they would have been likely killed or kneecapped anyway. Just, just, uh, just, just incredible. Well, you brought up uh, Constantino Roca. I know he. I don't think he's playing on the senior tour, but no. he's of that age. And now you're hosting the PGA Tour Champions Learning Center, which must be a blast. Um, you get to interact with legends of the game. Um, now, who's your favorite player to interview? Oh boy. Is there they're so I, honestly they're, they're all such good they're all such good guys and the fact that they can still remain competitive but yet be in, a, in an atmosphere that allows them to be themselves and be relaxed and and you know I, it still is ultra competitive i don't, I don't want to make it sound like it, it isn't but just to be with those guys I, I, boy that's a tough one i man you know I can't understand Jimenez all the time. I don't understand everything he says, but I love the way he says it. You know, he's so good at everything. He's just so good yeah. at everything. He's happy. I never saw a happier guy. You know, he was like, yeah. what's not to love? You know, it's not to love. Come here. You know, it's not good. Then he come here and then they come here. Um, I love, uh, I love couples. Freddie couples is good. When Freddie's, when Freddie's feeling good and engaged, he's just uh, really warm and friendly. Um, Jeez, who's a couple of our go-tos? Um, you know, Lang, Lang, Bernard Langer now has become, he's kind of funny. I, you wouldn't think that, you know, yeah. this guy from Germany would be that funny, but he's got this kind of wit and he's, he's totally, he's, he's a lot of fun uh, to be around. I enjoy him very much. Um, I, you know, all the guys are, Scotty McCarron's a great lesson, give, gives great lessons. Rocco's a character. Yeah, I love Rocco because yeah. all you do is just point the camera and go, Rocco. So tell us about the shot, and then he'll go for you know five minutes. You got five minutes of content. Yeah, um, there you can't miss. I mean, everywhere you go, and and the, the good part is someone has an opinion about something. Somebody's going to give you something of substance, you know, yeah. about about the game, about a shot, about an event, about what's happening, and uh, so that that's really the the nice part about about being around the guys, and it's 
it's just terrific to be able, you know, I think, I guess I can call, yeah, we become friends, you know, you become friends with the guys and, and some of the caddies yeah. as well, you know, you become, and you get to have lunch with them and sit down with them and, and, and really share some, you know, good conversation that you would have that wouldn't be media player conversation, which is they make nice. your job easy. Uh, it, it does. And I think they know, I think they know they trust us too. They know that we're going to, you know, it, it's all going to be good and it will all be done you know, always pr protecting them and making sure that they come off uh, the best that they possibly can. Yeah. So it does, it makes the job much easier. And, you know, you don't have to filter through coaches and uh, psychologists and agents and reps, and they're just, you know, guys out there hitting balls. So it's, it, it's kind of fun. I'll tell you what I really love. Um, I love hearing you interview Colin Montgomery. I know yeah. he's got a reputation of being surly, but I know that you've said, hey, he's, you know, maybe he's like Freddie if he's feeling good and he, he's out, outgoing. He says what's on his mind, which I love, right? Um, but are there any players that the rest of us would be surprised about knowing that, hey, they're actually – more pleasant or they're good guys despite what we hear based on the I think I, I think VJ would be one of those guys yeah I think you know my my relationship with VJ uh started probably in 2004 at the John Deere when the Annika Annika was going to play at Colonial and there was all this buzz and that was a big deal Annika was going to play in a men's event and that didn't happen and I think VJ was what he said was kind of misquoted about well he didn't say she didn't belong there but he said it's it playing with somebody that's not going to be sort of her style is going to whatever he said I think it was misinterpreted and then BJ didn't like the press anyway so we I end up meeting him and he's been peppered with questions about this the last maybe two or three weeks by the time I get to him and he comes off the stand in the media stand and I said I introduced myself he goes he looked me up and down he just stood there and he went like this he goes, you're taller than you look on television. <laughs> I said, well, okay. And I said, I'd like to talk to you. And he said, I don't know if I want to talk to you. And I said, well, I think you should. It's important for, you know, today, the subject matter. He said, I don't care what you think. <laughs> they ended up doing the interview. And the thing about VJ is one of those guys that if you don't stand up to him and you don't give it back, then you're, you're dead. He'll Be run done. you right over. No respect. No respect. He'll run you right over. But as the years have gone by, we've talked. We have conversations about, you know, things. I, you know, his son Cass, who I just saw at the PNC, and, and just about his health and, you know, his year this year. He actually sat down and did an interview. We haven't aired it yet, but he did it way back in December, which is really good about, um, you know, his development this year and what his new attitude is going to be. So I think he'd be one of those guys. Um, still kind of a hard ass, but, uh, and maybe a bit unpredictable, but I, I like him. I, I, I like him. He's, he's, uh, he's always given me, uh, for the most part, you know, what I needed. Um, but geez, I mean, you get to know guys and you know, like Mark and Brenda Kalkovecchia. I mean, here's a couple, they're always out there. Scott and Jenny McCarron, and, uh, Stephen and Kelly Ames. You get to know like kind of spouses too, and, and couples. And so it's, it's, it's really, I like, I mean, it's, I think it's where I need to, I should be right now. You know, I'm really happy oh, to be there. It's funny when you said VJ, the first thing he said to you was that you look, you're taller than you are on TV. <laughs> and I think that was the first thing I said to you as well, because we're always used to seeing you with uh, Shaq and other athletes like that. You're like six, four. Right? No, six, three. Not, you're my height. Like, maybe six, two, maybe. I think I've shrunk in my old yeah, age. You're like six, two, six, three, my height. And uh, compared to Shaq, you look like five five. <laughs> so it really throws you off once you see. Well, no person. matter no matter who we work with, you know, I'm working with power forwards here from the NBA. So of course I'm going to look smaller, you know, than, than a lot yeah, of these guys. I loaned. Oh, by the way, I loaned Shaq socks one time for a show. <laughs> we used to have lockers with clothes. He goes, Vince, do you have any socks? I go, I go, yeah, sure, grab a pair of socks. So we do. We're about 45 minutes in, and we go to break. He goes. Vince, goddamn, these socks are tight on my feet. <laughs> I can't feel my feet. <laughs> I said, well, I go, Shaq, you know, you're like a size 22. I said, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I only had human socks. 
That's all I had today. <laughs> you didn't have any uh, knee socks for him? I didn't have any Yeti socks that I could loan him for uh, <laughs> for the show. But he's such a good – oh, my guy's so funny. So Man, funny. That's really funny. Well, Vince, you've had um, an amazing career, and obviously it's not over, but you, you're clearly an expert at what you do. And I'm, I'm curious – I'm going to mention a phrase here. What does the term master craftsman mean to you? Well, you this know, is an important story. I think people should hear. Yeah. You're going to make me cry again. Like I did at that talk at, uh, at ID eight. Um, part of the uh, talk that I, 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 I so enjoy people who are really uh, good at their job, no matter what it is. I admire anybody who does, you know, I watch somebody do plumbing here or somebody work on, you know, uh, landscaping or auto, auto, automotive work. I, I just, I'm fascinated with somebody who's really good at what they do. You know, yeah. if they, like I, I'll even watch those YouTube videos of guys plastering and how good they are. And they, it's like, they're like artists. If I did that, it would look like a, you know, an orangutan was doing it. It'd be like, who did this? I have no aptitude for that. Um, that that's, uh, goes back to uh, my grandfather, my father's father, Sam Cellini, who came to this country at 17, um, and was, could not read or write English. And he just worked his, he just worked in a local factory at the Fisher body plant, making car chassis and, and doing a assembly line work uh, for 45 years there. And uh, at the end of his, when he retired, they gave him a gold watch and it said uh, the years from 1929 to 1954. And it said to master craftsman, Sam Cellini, which I still have the watch. And I thought to myself, if you could, if somebody could describe you at the end of your career, no matter what it was, as a master craftsman or craftswoman, I think that's a wonderful way to be remembered or thought of. So yeah. even in that job, you take pride in who you are and what you do every day and the job that you do and the service that you perform. And that's really what it goes down to. It's just, you know, taking pride in your work and being good every day, being consistent. And so... I always, I always think about him when I think I'm having a bad day or a hard day. I think, geez, I wasn't lifting, you know, floorboards from Ford trucks or, you know, all day and, and placing oh, them. In July with no air conditioning. Yeah. I mean, and those guys gladly did it. And he walked to and from work, you know, I mean, they gladly were, they were happy to have it. They were happy to have it, to put food on the table and buy a house and live this American dream, you know? And I think there's something to be said for that. There's something to be said for, you know, the, the basics that we do have, and hopefully we'll be able to keep. So that's what that means to me. And Jeff, you, uh, as, as a gift from my speech, you presented me with a beautiful uh, notepad, which is a leather bound pad that said Master Craftsman on it and my initials. And I, I do appreciate it. That was a wonderful gift. So that's what it means to me. And I think that no job is too small or unimportant. I think that we're all connected in that regard. And so I so admired him uh, yeah. for, for that still do yeah i'll tell you i think one of the things that you keep i said something to you once it's probably a year ago now but you it seems like nearly every time we talk you remind me of you know i've got a shelf life right you, <laughs> you repeated that phrase to me and i'm like they, you know but something that you said resonated um at, at the talk that you gave and part of it was around this master craftsman and you made the comment would you be willing to sign your signature to the work that you did that day right and hey that's a really important lesson at the end of the day if that were a painting would you sign it yeah right or would you walk away and go yeah that wasn't that wasn't my best work today no that's and that's that's what i say to a lot of my young uh, workers i said you know come in here and i want you to do the best job you possibly can because every show that i do i have to sign off on i autograph that i put my signature on that show look here's what yeah. i did see so you should be able to sign off and sign your work are you willing to do that at the end of the day and say, look, I did this job today and here it is. Or are you going to slink away and know that that thing was not your best? And there's going right. to be days when it won't be your best. But did you put every effort to make that happen? And how proud are you of the work you do? So will you sign off on this work? Because you're going to say you're handing me this highlight sheet. Are you really did you uh, did you stamp this? Is this as good as you, yeah. is this as good as you can do yeah. that you handed me? Yeah. You know, so. That, that's how I've approached everything in my life, whether it was playing ball or going to work or doing shows or writing. 
Well, part of that's fear, fear of failure. <laughs> right. I, I have that yeah. sort of inner drive where I don't want to be bad at anything. And so that's sort of a perfectionist yeah, Vince, a little bit. Vince, you're in a position where you get paid a, a lot of money. Can't get, right? I can't be wrong. Say, What's that? I can't be wrong on TV. I can't go spew incorrect information. I can't. Well, it's yeah, not, but I mean, it's not acceptable. People, people, people pay you a fair amount of money because you're good at what you do. And you're right. It has to be perfect. Right. When you like, like your first day at the golf channel, you're live with, with uh, Arnold Palmer. Right. And you've got to be, you've got to deliver. Yes. Right. They're not paying you to not deliver. And the other part about what you do, it's all on film, right? Like my day is not on film. Know. But I think that idea of, am I willing to sign off on my effort today, right? And it's not whether I created a masterpiece or not. It's whether I put forth my best effort, right? There were football games that both of you played in that you played your heart out and you didn't play well, but you still gave it your all, right? You should still be willing at the end of the day and say, I'm signing this or, or a scorecard in a golf event. I gave well, I think, it my all on every shot. I still shot 85, which I'm not happy about, but I didn't give up. I gave my all on every shot. Yeah, I think, you know, the other thing is that on television, one of the factors that people don't really realize is that um, I, may, I may have had a rotten day. You know, I may have had, I may be sick. I may have somebody in my family who's ill. We may have had a, a flood in my basement that day. And uh, an old uh, assignment editor I had at Channel 8 in Cleveland, Mickey Flanagan, who, who looks just like you think Mickey Flanagan would look uh, back <laughs> in, that, in those days, old newspaper guy. He said, kid, nobody cares if your dog died this morning. They want their sports and they want to be entertained. And that's, a, th that's sort of one of the aspects of this that people kind of underrate is that you have to go on there and deliver. And it's, it's a performance. Uh, no matter well, you, what's going on. Think back. I know um, when your mother was ill. Yeah. Right. You still had chose to. It. Of course. And sometimes as difficult as that is, we draw inspiration from those moments in those situations. Right. Yeah. Like this one's for mom or this one's for my grandfather or. Right. Um, sometimes that. That, it, not, that inspiration draws us to do even better work than had we not been going through that. Yeah, and I've, I've had a call where, uh, you know, I've had sons that are in emergency rooms with football injuries or baseball injuries or someone got hurt or my dad was ill. And you get those calls, you know, an hour or so before a show. And you, you've got to compartmentalize that and just, you know, do, do your work. And yeah, athletes go through this too. I mean, how many guys have played NFL games or played baseball or played rounds of golf where – you know, there, you've got to compartmentalize anything that's happening in your life. And that, man, that's part of athletic training is that the, the, the mental discipline right. to be able to focus on the task at hand. So yeah. that's why sports are so important. I think for everyone is to teach you a little mental discipline along the way. It's not the winning and losing. It's not yeah. winning championships, being a pro it's, it's learning how to be disciplined enough mentally to work your way through some of these, these things that are taking place and still be able to focus and get a job and, and execute what you're supposed to do. Yeah. And I, that's why for Hayden, that's going to be, that's the training for you. You're, you're a quarterback. I mean, you got to process everything. You're, you're, you have to know what everyone's doing on the field at that time. You know, yeah. it's the hard, that's the hardest position in any team sport, in my opinion, quarterback. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> I definitely agree. Um, um, so there, there's a, humbly, a humbly he agrees. Humbly he agrees. <laughs> Even when you're throwing for 557 yards or whatever it is. There you go. Thanks for remembering the number. Well, Vince, you just reminded me of something. Uh, you might recall last year, uh, Camilo, uh, Camilo Vijegas, his son died of right. brain cancer, right? Like 11 month old child. And a couple of weeks later, he's got to be back out there providing for his family. He's been struggling at golf. Um, I, I can't even imagine. No. You know, having to, uh, can you imagine that? And, and golf is a pr relatively solitary sport. I mean, you're walking down the fairway, 
sometimes by yourself and wh where do you think your thoughts go right and the same with you when you're broadcasting ha having had personal tragedy or you know injured children or a mother that's ill or what have you but right. You know, you've been, you've had a great career, Vince. Are there any interviews or broadcasts that you're particularly proud of that, you know, that you signed and you go, that is some great work there? Well, I, I, yeah, I, I, some things come to mind. Um, I think for CNN Sports, I, I really believe the best thing I ever did, we had Art Modell on live on a Sunday morning for our NFL show right after the move to Baltimore, when the Browns moved to Baltimore. And uh, it became very heated. What's that? That trader? It became very heated in that I asked him some tough questions. And I think he thought I was going to softball him because I knew him from Cleveland. And, you know, I, we had worked together a long time. We had a relationship. I mean, I knew him. He knew me. And, and uh, I asked him really tough questions and I put him on the spot. But I felt like my obligation was to all those people in Cleveland who wanted to, who wanted to ask these questions of him. Why is our football team not here right now? Um, but I came out of that. And uh, a lot of, not from him, <laughs> but, a lot, but I, I got a lot of positive feedback. After the interview was over, we have the raw tape when he's not on the air anymore, but we're still rolling. Yeah. And he looks at Kevin Byrne, his PR guy. And he goes, you got any more brilliant effing ideas? He looked at him <laughs> about the appearance. <laughs> oh, well, man. Vince, I think, I think one of your, the best things that you did um, and we didn't talk about it because it's not sports related was um, your work on 9-11. Oh, well, I, I think that's one of those things where you're just thrown into a situation and uh, you just have to be, trust your instincts on things. I had, you know, we had 12 minutes to go on a morning show. I, I did, I was doing news on CNN from seven to nine, Monday through Friday. And uh, <clears throat> we found out as the, the next shift's crew was coming down ashen and panicked coming down the stairs from their meeting to get to the set because the plane had gone into the World Trade Center. And I said, say, say again? And he said, a plane has hit the World Trade Center. So you just start to go to instinct, instincts about piecing together what happened, not getting ahead of yourself, but staying in the moment. Here's what we know. Here's what we're trying to find out. Here's someone who saw it. And now we, you know, we're, we're starting to build a, a little bridge of information so but I, I was proud to be able to handle something like that and and not be overwhelmed I mean I can imagine that's like being in Hawaii for Pearl Harbor and you had to broadcast that you know or we're under attack yeah, you know, yeah but I so think it's, I think the difference is you had a national audience there were international. People glued to the, yeah, internet. <laughs> international there were people glued to the tv that you were you broke the news to them that this is what's happened yeah, they, the they saw the film, the, the coverage, the the footage with your with your voice as the backdrop, and um, that's where instinct pops in. You you probably weren't even thinking in the, no, in the moment. It, you were just no. Talking. You just try to stay in the moment and start to piece things together. I mean, that's but you know that that's as it's unfolding. And again, not getting ahead of the story or speculating. That's the worst thing you can do is try to speculate or or you know assume something happened. But you know there have been great moments like being on the field and and. Yankee Stadium after the Yankees won a, not that I'm a Yankee fan, but he won a world championship and CNN used to take us live if we were sports back then. This is like 98, I think it was. Or, and and they would take us, we were their programming, you know, so here's Joe Torre and here's Giuliani and, you know, here's Billy Crystal and here's, you know, and these guys are coming and that's fun. That's the most, you know, to be yeah. able to carry the network or post Super Bowl coverage or just, you know, I, I just enjoy when, when live TV meets a great moment and you're, you're part of yeah. it. That's, I, I, that's what I really enjoy. Yeah. That's, that's what it's the whole thing for me, actually. Yeah. I think that's what people most enjoy as well <clears throat> is a live um, reel where you're not, it's not scripted uh, and you know, anything can happen. Um, yeah. That's the most exciting for me as well. Do you have any advice for any wannabe broadcasters that may be listening? Um, I would say uh, become a good be, a writer and storyteller, I think that's a lost art or a lost aspect of what we do. I think today we have takes, everybody's got a take. I'm gonna get on the morning, I've got a take, I'm gonna scream it at you. And uh, I think be a good writer. Um, if you're an interviewer, listen, that's the most important part. People don't listen during their interviews. Be prepared, 
do a lot of preparation. I mean, hours of preparation going to shows. People don't understand. You can't just, even, even last year, I was doing something when they, uh, locally here in Atlanta, where the, the, the Braves clinched against the Dodgers in the NLCS. And, and uh, we were supposed to go to live shots. They go, hey, yeah, just, you know what, get on the set. And then you'll just toss it out to these guys and they'll take it live. Well, that's how you plan it. But then all of a sudden the live shots are all down. So I'm filling for 10 minutes live. And fortunately, you know, I'm pre I've prepared my notes as to what this would mean tonight for the Braves, what they did, what the series was like. So you're able to get through that and not just, you know, hamina, 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 but you're able to actually still convey information and do that. So be prepared and um, work at your craft. Try to get better. If it's something you're passionate about, try to be better all the time. I did. I would watch tapes of myself years ago and say, well, I could, see, I could do that better. Why am I, why is my hand gesture this way or you know, all, all of those things. So just if, if you have a passion for it, uh, study people that are really good and yeah. then, and do that as well. That's what I would say about it. Excellent. Or Excellent. maybe have a dad in the business who can get you started. <laughs> there you go. Learn from the best. There you go. Um, so what's next for Vince Cellini? You have anything, I, um, you're, you're going to, you've got a movie coming out next year. Well, it's, yeah, I mean, I don't really, I'm, I'm in a part of that, but uh, I'm, I'm doing a little, uh, I'm doing some business things, some voiceover work uh, for golf presentations and clubs around the country. Um, I also um, will continue to do my TV work at Golf Channel, do that. Um, and uh, I, I plan to do more writing. And Jeff, as you said, maybe voiceover work. I'm kind of cultivating yeah. that right now as well. So I want to work locally, nationally, and just continue to contribute on television as long as they'll have me you know I'm very happy and content right now to to sort of pick and choose assignments because I've worked for 40 years I I, I gave it a lot I gave yes. everything I had so I'm going to kind of ease into this next or transition into this next phase you know and maybe yeah. I don't know maybe do a, a combination podcast bartender guy down at uh on the Florida's west coast you know like I thought Jackie, about that Jackie Gleason show you can be crazy Guggenheim. You know, how about, that's such, oh my gosh, nobody remembers this. You don't remember this, Hayden. Jackie, you know who Jackie Gleason is? No. Oh. <laughs> no? Okay. Jackie Gleason's this uh, entertainer. He was the Honeymooners. You ever seen the Honeymooners? Yeah. He's the guy in the Honeymooners. I think. And he's sort of an entertainer, but he has this variety show that he's doing. And he's also a movie actor. He's in The Hustler. He's fantastic in The Hustler, which is an yeah. amazing movie. So he loves Miami. And they did everything, what, out of New York back then, right, Jeff? Was everything yeah, done out of New yeah. York City? I yeah. guess CBS. He goes, I'm yeah. not, we're doing my show in Miami. They moved the entire show to Miami, and that's where he wanted to be, and that's where they did the show. That was part of what he wanted to do. And nobody did that back then. You were either in L.A. or New York. That was it. He goes, nope, we're going to Miami. And he'd come out with that little cup of that coffee. You thought it was coffee at the beginning of the show? Yeah, coming, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's coming out and have a little pop before the show <laughs> but crazy guggenheim remember him the oh bartender? yeah oh yeah mm -hmm. yeah he had well he and gleason had all those characters that he did on the show uh reginald van gleason and the and the the uh, poor soul and he did uh yeah you know uh the, the june taylor kind of, dancers the, the june, june taylor, taylor dancers well, you know Vince, what's your you, favorite hobby my hobby yeah so if you were to do a, a little podcast show like this what would um, your hobby you know, and your show be i like uh, i'm starting to kind of cook more believe it or not okay i'm doing a lot more cooking i am i actually made dinner uh the other night Four dogs I'm, I'm, don't I'm, count <laughs> and so I'm, I'm starting i'm starting to cook a little more and um i i love music i love any i, I love anybody who can play and so i'm starting to uh, actually putz around my son left a guitar here. I had to restrung. And so I want to start doing some of that stuff too. Because you get to this point in your life, I'll be 63 on Friday. And you get to a point in your life, you're like, well, wait a minute. I, I haven't done this and I haven't done that. And then you start to think how much, I don't have much time. It, it's really funny that you, life is so, it, it kind of plods along. But then when you get to a certain point, you think, oh my gosh, I haven't done this. I don't know if you ever feel that way, Jeff. Yeah, 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 yeah. And yeah, so, I try to do, 
Yeah, I try to do take on as many things as possible. I remember a couple of years ago, we were in Costa Rica. And my girlfriend says, we're going to go rappelling. And I'm like, the hell I am. I mean, I, I may watch you, but I, I'm not. And there I am rappelling down a hundred foot waterfall, right? Literally sure. water on you. I mean, it was like, but you got to take on those things that keep you alive. So the challenges. Well, I would love to have watched you do that. Watch <laughs> well, I get down there and I was the first one down and they've got two guys to kind of catch you there or to guide you down. And they go, God, it's too bad. You weren't here like seven seconds ago. There's a huge poisonous snake here in the water because the water that you're standing in is about that deep. You're like, Oh, that's great. <laughs> I got to, uh, I jumped out of a plane as a local story in Cleveland. I tandem jumped once, once. I would love to do that. And I got in a lot of trouble for doing that because I did it. And my news director called me in and said, you know, we're, if anything happened to you, we would be liable for your accidental death or whatever happened to you. So that's why you set your family up. <laughs> well, yeah, without me around, <laughs> But I did that, so I, I, I can say I've done that. But, you know, I, honestly, I was just thinking about this. As you get another birthday, I, I think I've checked a lot of boxes. I married the girl I wanted to marry. I had a career I wanted. I had boys that, that I don't really think I could. I don't think I could ask for anything else. I've been so very, very fortunate, really. Have Good friends, amazing friends. Yet? Have you shot I'm under far yet? I'm, not, I'm upright, which is I'm, I'm happy about, so. I, I didn't hear you, Hayden. Ask that question again. I said, have you shot under par yet? Uh, no, I haven't done that yet. <laughs> there you go. That's Damn. another box. There's another box. To <laughs> Which I, I haven't either. I've shot par. But Hope I live good. long enough to do that. <laughs> what's next? Uh, what's on your bucket, your golf bucket list? Is there I think that. I, I think I'd like to get better at, at golf. I'd like to really improve and, and now really kind of focus that. I want to, um, you know, I'm considering a, a local club here to, uh, to play. And I, I'd really like to, to get better. But again, you know, you, you really got to devote time to it. I mean, I talked to guys who have who've done that, but you, you, I mean, I've got a grandchild coming in September and, you know, I, you make choices about what you're going to do with your time now, you know? Yeah, right. And so you, you, you have to, you, you have to do that, but I, I, I wouldn't mind trying to uh trying to get better and, and just improve and and make make it so that i really enjoy the, you know the the idea of going out and and playing but i got to get healthy first i've had like the shoulder thing and a knee thing and you've you got to dedicate one to two days a week if you want to improve so it's not full days i mean we can't no no i'm saying an hour practice session in a round of golf a week if you're right. gonna improve at all it's it's just tough if you don't play, you, you're not going to get better. It's just, that's the game of golf. Right. So exactly. maybe that, I don't know, maybe start some tourism business in Europe, <laughs> golf tourism. I was thinking about that. Only Turned an it. idiot would do that. <laughs> 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 or a pair of idiots. No. Yeah. Is that it guys? There's nothing else. I don't know what else I can give you. I'm just, uh, I mean, I'm just, I missed an old timer. I'm a senior citizen just trying to make it. That's it. You know? I'm sure you've got a hundred other stories, but I do. We, and we'll come back. We'll, we'll talk. We'll tell some more stories we'll do it about, again for sure. About the tour, about meeting Tiger, about you know Phil, about you know all those things. Oh, about, no, we didn't even jump into back. LIV. Yeah, we What's didn't that? jump into LIV. We didn't jump into LIV, and I think it's uh, you know, there's certain things you can say and can't say, right? Yeah, I mean, look, it's those are personal choices. Um, I, I know that with, with, with the money comes, you know, a, a, the, the moral aspect of all of this too, but you know, the lure of that kind of money, it, I, I don't know. I'm not on that plane. I'm not a Dustin Johnson well, or a Phil Mickelson. So I don't know. They you took your responsibility they took for Jerry your family. Bolt as a uh, presenter. What if they'd have given you come to you? Would you have gone? I don't know. I, I, you know, I just was approached by someone who said they had a connection with uh, LIV. I, um, that's tough. That's I didn't mean to put you on the spot. I'm not no, I, I, and again, I, I'm not, I, you know, I'm not casting aspersions on it, whatever, you know, that you want to do. I just think it's one of those things where, um, you'd have to, I'd have to really, really think about all the aspects of that one. You well, know? Vince, I saw an interview with one of the guys that's playing over there. 
He's a lesser known pro, although he was a U.S. amateur champ. He went to Georgia Tech. His name's Andy Ogletree. And, and he was on uh, Matt Adams' show. Uh -huh. And he was asking him some hard questions. And I thought Andy Ogletree had a good response. He said, you know, I, it's interesting that, that Amer the Americans have an issue with us playing over there, yet we sell billions every year of military equipment to the Saudis. They're our ally. Yeah. So, you know, we're not, we're not banned by the U S government from playing over there, but no. And I have, I have sort of less of, um, I have a problem, but maybe I don't have a problem. I just obviously concerns, I guess more, but you know, I worked for the NBA for a number of years and we would have Chinese new year and we would have guys with, Chinese symbols on their jerseys for a week. Hey, it's Chinese New Year week, you know, and all this. And I thought, I used to say, you know, does anyone want to talk about human rights issues in China here? And be like, <coughs> uh, 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 you know, and, and it's true. I mean, we, NBA was, they were partners with China for a long time and, and no one said a word, you know. Well, we, you know, the whole Kaepernick issue with, with him t taking a knee, right? If you watch English Premier Soccer, they're still taking an E, the whole team, uh, both sides. There's no debate about, about whether they should do it or not. Well, anyway. Yeah, I mean, and this is the uh, cross-pollination of, of politics and sports, you know, that's, that's taking place now. And uh, they're intertwined. Um, yeah. So, you know, he's going back. Ka Kaepernick's what, a Raider? So you ready for that, Jeff? Are you, gonna, are you happy about that? Well, I... I when the Raiders, uh, camp. the Raiders <laughs> pulled a Modell and moved to uh, Oakland or back to Oakland while I was there. Um, yeah, I, I lost. Uh, I actually gave up my season tickets because the fans were so rude. Like if I, I, I was married at the time. My wife and I would go to a game and they, you know, guys are whistling at her and. No, it's yeah, good. Yeah, yeah. That, and then the Alameda, other thing that would Alameda County, Alameda County Stadium there. The, no, no, no. In L.A. It was oh, in, in L.A. I thought you meant Oakland. Okay. And then what they would do is the other thing I didn't like was at the time it was a. 12 game season, right? And there were probably four preseason games of which two of them would be at home. So you were so. And you're paying full price for preseason games. No one shows up from pre, for preseason games. And then the people that pay $8 for a seat come down into your seats, right? And you're like, why, why do I have to pay full boat for these tickets when I could just... Anyway, I gave up my seats. <laughs> anyway, you know, you've been... Uh... Oh, go ahead. No, 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 that's, that's fine. We, we'll, we'll just, we'll save it for our next, uh, our next visit. For sure. Excellent. Vince, you've been very, very generous, very gracious with your time. We really appreciate it. Um, I think our listeners are going to love what you had to say, your pers your perspective, your take on things. And I wish I had, I uh, wish we each had a glass of champagne because I'd like to give you a toast and uh, wish you well as a master craftsman going well, forward. Well, thank you, Jeff. It's always a pleasure to spend time with you. It's got, it's been really great to get to know you and 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 Hayden you as well. Uh, you're sure. a great family. And uh, I wish you well. So don't be strangers. Just call me up anytime. You got it. Thank, thank you so you, much. Man. All right. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much again to Vince for coming on with us today. Um, it really was an honor to be able to talk with you about your life and your experiences. Um, some of the people that you've interviewed, some of the stuff that you've done. Um, we really appreciate you coming on and giving us your time. If y'all enjoyed it, please like and share. Um, and we'll see you guys next week. Thank you.